So thanks, everyone. Um, Bahosi, I wanted to start by touching a little bit on your sort of skepticism as it pertains to Afrofuturism. Um, I think Manny and I spoke a little bit about what uh, Sadia Hartman says in the beginning of Scenes of Subjection, which is kind of about a narcissistic identification with the other that obliterates the other, um, which reminded me then of what you said about sort of how your work exists within the international gaze, specifically of you know Black Americans as it comes as it pertains to Africa. Yeah, I mean, well, okay. First of all, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. You know, it's like it's my first time in LA and all of that. So, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the Afrofuture conversation also then ties into like, well, part of that ties into this broader, you know, African diaspora back and forth um, that happens in culture and in like social, in social culture. Um, And I think that speaks a lot to the way we see each other, you know, um, as, you know, disenfranchised global people, you know. Um, but yeah, a lot of my early criticisms had to do with just that, um, the sort of uncomfortableness that I had about like this returned gaze of concepts around, you know, African history that I couldn't relate to or that seemed a little out of touch with, um, you know, the actual fabric of the history and the complexity of, you know, what's happened, you know, in Africa. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if many, um, yeah, I guess, we can kind of lead up to that point and start from a more basic uh, understanding of why the term Afro or Afrofuturism, Afropessimism too, <laughs> why the term Afrofuturism is maybe like a conceptual misstep. First of all, it's obviously redundant. Uh, if something is futuristic, it's probably Afro. So that linking them together in that way, it's, it kind of speaks to that gaze that you're talking about, Michaela the international gaze that kind of fetishizes this understanding of history or this understanding of a place indexed to the past or indexed to, to pre-humanity, right? It's a really problematic thing. Uh, and again, it erases the idea or the truth that the African uh, situation is already futurist and has already had a kind of speculative bent, a technological bent, right? Um, so from that kind of more basic level, we can start to get to where Bahosi's head is when he's talking right now about um, the clashes between the mainland and the diaspora and ways to repair that, ways in which we can re-understand what technology means to encompass more things than like plastic and silicon and metal, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in almost in a sense, the critique of Afrofuturism, it's not just to shit on Mark Derry, there's like a usefulness there to bring in the conversation about mainland and diaspora, right? So there's a kind of covert usefulness to the term even. Also like another aspect of like, um, because I guess it's a case that's adopted, you know, by us, but when it's that first step of engagement, which would be like, just like a white, you know, a white person looking, um, I think it also, what we're speaking now speaks to yeah, well, I guess what you just said, but just this uh, very real and continuous um, uh, kind of representation of Africa, you know, that hasn't changed since, like, you know, since tourism as an industry, you know, popped up. Um, yeah, so it's also, I think that's also another really necessary conversation. And also as far as just like, um, professional spaces and like the whole, you know, knowledge economy and uh, 
what it is that, uh, uh, what kind of like intellectual trends, you know, get, you know, have a wave or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how conscious this was, but to me, when we start with the absent black father bot video, it's kind of a pun about that. Uh, a pun about how people bring all this American baggage to the work. Because um, we were talking, you know, this whole single parenthood thing has a very American connotation, but kind of that erases the fact that it happens all over the world, right? And it, but it also brings into the conversation, like, the things that people are assuming about things, or th the yeah, the visual or conceptual assumptions that people have seeing this kind of work. So I like to start with that one because it, it kind of puts it right out there, right? Um, yeah, I think sort of riffing off of that, you mentioned a little bit that your work tends to get received in through a lens of maybe post-internet, post-apartheid. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe access you mentioned that the preliminary, pre preliminary point of looking is a white person looking. And is that more in like a general sense? Like is in like the way that we're socialized to look? Like internally? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I interpret it as like a kind of mass curse, you know, that has been cast um, through the language of like, or through the uh, phenomenon of like traumas, or generational traumas, etc. Um, yeah, wait, what was the point? What, what are you saying again? Actually. No, it was like access and how like, you know, like I feel like sometimes my ability to read your work is limited in that my perspective, you know, is what it is in that I'm in California, you know, um, where the ideology of optimizing the self, I mean, California, America, and, you know, so on and so on, um, is just so normal, normalized, right? Um, so I, I kind of read things through that with the crystals and the, the affirmations, um, even when you move from like being protagonist in some of the videos to being a host, it's, you know, I think of like self-help and things like that, as opposed to maybe being able to read it through a more, um, yeah, post-colonial and like a specific South African sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was definitely like super deliberate. Um, how should I tag this? I just feel like the real gag is that like, <laughs> New Age um, industries have been built on the exploitation of black indigenous cultures. Um, so, and fully being fully aware that, like you know, a, a visual moment like crystal, you know, usage is tied to a very certain thing. Um, from my background crystal use is very much a part of like African traditional religious uh, uh, practices. Um, and so that also trickles down into pretty much, you know, you know, like you can go, yeah, it, yeah. Um, the whole shit is just super appropriated. And there's an element of reclaiming that Or making use of that, um, you know, that accent, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you purposely, not prevent, but yeah, you purposely discourage access from certain vantage points. Like, the work is, is meant to have these kind of obfuscating gestures to me like the use of poor image, even though there's not really a post-internet conversation, right? Because um, that comes more out of the need to get the stuff out quickly and, and using these quick gestures and the medium of video mm -hmm. as it ties into circulation, like it's so heavily attached to it. Um, so it's less about post-internet and more just about getting it done to me. 
Exactly. Yeah. 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 Super then, pragmatic. And then like this, the these gestures of like commerce or almost like spam, right? Like um, spiritual spam almost. <laughs> this is a kind of obfuscating thing. Like it's a way to get people interested on a one-on-one -on -one level, but it protects a lot of other stuff. I think. Ah, uh, that's what you're obfuscating. Yeah. Yeah. That's my perspective. Yeah. 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 Um. I was interested with what you just said. Because I feel like, you know, in a way, in, in the same way that like the relation between technology and spiritual practices is for some people non-apparent, I feel like the relationship between spirituality and commerce is, you know, similarly uh, not looked at enough. Um, and even just purely from a metaphysical point of view, you know, what that means, what that kind of exchange means. It's an energy exchange, you know, when you're dealing with money. Um, and the other's ways of, you know, we, and there's something we've, we've just been talking a lot about, so that's why I'm always like, you know, half hesitant to like, you know, repeat myself or whatever. But, um, Oh, you want to grab it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm just like connecting. Um, I think just to make you repeat yourself, we had a good tangent earlier where um, you were saying, like, with as spirituality is also influenced by the market, right? Mm -hmm. So is you know the internet and the technology that we use, um, and like that being completely. Yeah, mapped by market demands was something that you were interested in. Yeah, I've been doing like a little bit of research on um, this concept of a psychic vampirism or psychic par parasites yeah. um, as it relates to uh, media technologies. Um, and yeah, I found like interesting resources that, and also just in general, I feel I'm interested in the idea that the electromagnetic space um, is a space, is the same space we're talking about if we're talking about etheric space. And that within uh, these higher senses or higher frequencies or states, physical states, that they are innumerable <laughs> forms of life occupying those. Um, that I think in culture have been described in lots of different ways or have been interpreted in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But it, it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's lending towards that, that kind of research. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, my whole thing when like studying uh, the occult has always been to just figure out, trying to understand the mechanics of, you know, etheric states or astral conditions. Mm -hmm. um, like in a very practical way, breaking down what certain rituals what kind of certain actions, what, what it is about certain actions mm -hmm. that create certain effects. Um, oh, so like practices like, you know, like in ancestral veneration, like practices of libation, for example, you know, what it is about pouring of liquid yeah. that is transferred energetically to the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is, yeah, I guess, like a lot of other people involved in, you know, these fringe conversations or whatever, um, the electromagnetic spectrum can't kind of explain that or provides a space for some of these forces to exist, I feel. And it's been like interesting to like uh, run with that, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting that you touch on, you know, putting technology and spirituality, like two immaterial things, somewhat immaterial, um, depending on how you look at it, um, next to each other. And it reminds me of this book that Eric Davis wrote called Technosis. Um, and he talks about technomysticism um, and sort of the, how like historically technology has helped to disenchant the world. Um, and I quote, forcing the ancestral symbolic networks of old to give way to the crisp secular game plans of economic development, skeptical in inquiry and material progress. But the old phantasms and met metaphysical longings did not exactly disappear. And I think in that sense, that's where you come in. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's also, there's, it's a number of agendas as well, I guess. There's like a more like covertly political agenda of uh, finding ways of dismantling shit, you know? Um, Because for me, what I've been really interested, you know, with where we are as, you know, a global black situation, um, I think the place right now where there's progress as far as like the liberation process goes is in actions that take things back to the internal. Um, the, internal? the internal. Internal, yeah. So accessing inner worlds. Um, and because there's a lot that's happening there that isn't being addressed, I think. Um, in South Africa, we have this, I always bring this up, but there's this fairly new um, socialist political party called the EFF, Economic Freedom Fighters. And, you know, this is part of, like, the language, the post-democratic language of, okay, we have had, uh, well, we've had uh, political freedom, now it's time for uh, economic freedom. But my feeling has always been that that can never happen if there is no, like, space for uh, spiritual... stock taking, <laughs> a special stock taking and complete, uh, uh, yeah, just reclamation. Uh, because I've found that, and these aren't even conversations that happen, but white power has really like exploited, you know, and in some ways, this is actually very related to new age industries, but white power is, found a lot of ways of exploiting, you know, indigenous practices in order to harness more, to, to enrich themselves. Um, and this is part of like, I wouldn't really know what to cite this, you know, like, but it's just, there's, there's, there's lines of thinking and there's like oral histories um, that to me speak to that, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think you need to look that far, I mean, I live in Portland, so I, I know a ton of racist New Age people. <laughs> and I know a lot of them end up in a lot of eugenics situations, too. Like, they love eugenics. You know, like, oh, there's too many people. People aren't living the right way. There's a chosen few, that kind of stuff. It's very common. So uh, you don't need to look that far to, to see how they use New Age discourse to, like, perpetuate or generate white power. It's like, to me, it's very prevalent. Um, I think in terms of the in bringing things back to the internal as being the only way that economic freedom might I happen. Say the only way. Oh, okay. I would say it's an unaccessed way. I guess I betrayed myself because it might be the only way. Yeah. <laughs> only in the yeah. sense that, like, you know, okay. our bodies are all we have, or in the sense of like having to be be your own brand and like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just like. I don't know. If that's, like. I don't know if that's gonna help that. Yeah. I mean, no. I. I I, th I think it's like, it's like the thing that frees us and the thing that binds us at the same time. 
But I also wanted to ask that you maybe define spirituality um, in this, because you said a spiritual reckoning. And like, I think of it as maybe interconnectedness or understanding that or perceiving that, but I want to hear what it means for you. Um, so, so maybe this is also like an opportunity for like a little like shared education. But like for me, I draw specifically from just family customs. Um, so it's related to a lot of like ancestral things. Um, But I would say, honestly, in a spiritual awakening like, is a very violent thing for me, I've found in my personal experience. And it's also just something that people don't really speak up on more. The fact that any kind of spiritual undertaking or like spiritual journey is you know, extremely traumatizing and violent. You know? and in a lot of ways, that's how I accessed, you know, or came to certain points of like taking certain factors in my life more seriously was through <laughs> like moments of, yeah, extreme tra trauma. And I suppose that's a bit of a pattern that we can maybe find, I don't know, if like that's your experience. Um, but yeah, I, and, I, and I like this actually, like, because, you know, just to counter from, like, just the general conversation, like, to me, spiritual awakening is just violent as AF. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, has a lot more to do with... Uh, disruption. Disruption in order to, like, I don't know, come out on the other side you know, in the end, you know? So not like destruction, but like disruption. Yeah. It's another term that's been appropriated by Silicon Valley, right? Also. Well, I can speak to that, but I was thinking about uh, this idea of going internal, or if we're talking about spirituality, like working on these abstract or immaterial realms and going internal. Uh, it's normally seen as like a renunciation of material and a kind of sequestering yourself from the world. But I think it's important to emphasize like the way you're describing it is the opposite of that. And it's, it's inherently violent and it inherently changes the structure of the material around you, right? Like going inward and doing this kind of spiritual reckoning or spiritual stock taking, it has to result in political upheaval, right? And to me that makes a lot of sense in the church that I was raised in at least. But I think a lot of this kind of white New Age conversation has been about renunciation and about going inward is more about doing your own thing and living your own life. And that's not really what we're talking about, I feel like. But that's cool, too. I mean, that's self-care or whatever. But right? <laughs> okay. it's, an abuse of, it's an abuse of the culture. No shade. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's definitely an abuse of the culture. Like, yeah. Um, I think in terms of trauma, when I initially, you know, was thinking about the way that you deal with trauma in your work, I kind of went to a more maybe um, historical place. But then when I watched the contract revocations, um, to me, they sort of illuminated the technological landscape as a site um, for trauma and you kind of made a map of non-consent, right? Like, I do not consent to um, predictive modeling or th um, kind of like revoking the algorithm's access to the way you navigate digital spaces. And so it was just interesting for me to think about, yeah, to have that made strange and then made plain 
um, just because it's so, you know, omnipresent. And I don't really, yeah, I just don't think about it that often. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's lots of ways. And I guess, yeah, <laughs> I got nothing to add to that. I kind of have a follow-up question that could tie into this silicon trauma thing, or this tech trauma thing that you mentioned. Um, I love this, like, with Consciousness Engine or Absent Black Father Bot, you have this, like, these two talking heads that it almost feels like they're reciting found text, even though that is an actual conversation across six years on Facebook. It, it gives this kind of, yeah, found text element, a robotic element, um, and that's really contrasted with the the revocation stuff and, and the soul contract stuff where you're reciting found text but it feels very personal and very embodied and like something that I would say, something that you would say, right? So I, I wondered if maybe you could speak to that. Switch up. Yeah, the kind of, um, in one case the personal appears as found text and in the other found text appears as very authorial and, and personal. So I don't know, is that a question? <laughs> I mean, you know, Emmanuel, you always come with like some blow your mind shit, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, all the videos also occupy different spaces of like intent, like with a lot of like the lo-fi stuff, um, well, all the lo-fi stuff was done in like my final year and uh, spoke to a design, a, a, a very like, art bro desire moment to like, you know, like I was saying before, like map out a kind of, figure out ways to map out a lexicon of like cultural signifiers in uh, 90s South Africa that, you know, I, in my mind reflected the political shifts and ideologies of like different presidents that we've had. Um, and then I feel like that, so that, kind of mm, broad, you know, oversight, I think through the years has, I've been figuring out ways to distill that um, and to like bring that closer to myself mm -hmm. and, you know, the things that I deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something you were talking about before too about how some of these gestures, they're functional, but then also they let you speak to how these macro, uh, macro things are inscribed into the interpersonal, right? Mm -hmm. And into the individual. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's, it's a basic strategy that I've used and that I found to be super effective. You know? I wanna make like, <laughs> I wanna make a really like corny reference right now, but <laughs> I don't know, just like growing up, uh, like my mother, like played a lot of like, or some Bob Marley like live shows. And one of the things that have always, has always impressed in me about Bob Marley's music. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rasta shit, bro. <laughs> right, I was like, can I just like, <laughs> but I, well, you know. The reason that this is funny is because this racist dude at one of the last panels was like, so Rasta culture, like, and we're like, oh, because he has dreads, of course he's gonna ask that. Like, yeah, but so he had fucking Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard though. Please FYI. bring us out again, <laughs> please. Still waiting on that check. What's up? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, what was I saying? Mm. Bob Marley. Look, Bob Marley. Marley. Right. So this. So what I always appreciate about Bob Marley is in like his political songs was his ability to make love songs that were just super potently political. Um, and that just, just always struck me as like, oh, this is like a perfect way to like, because communication is also a really big part of what I desire as, as an artist. It's like uh, sh sharing and building and putting concepts out there, you know? Yeah. So uh, spe that speaks to that, I think, yeah. Yeah, can you say more to that? Because I think it ties into one of the early questions about access. How? You want to be relatable, it sounds like. Or maybe not. Maybe you want the work to be relatable. Yeah. Uh, relatable? Is the relatable is the same as accessible? No. no. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think access is more what it is. Re there is, so another thing like with the videos is also like because they're superly South African referenced, um, there is like a big part of my practice that was wanting to put images in, you know, white cube spaces in South Africa that weren't there. And that spoke specifically to like urban black experience. Um, so there's that. Yeah, access is definitely like super important. Yeah. Relatability, I don't know. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I guess, humor in your work. Um, I think I noticed two moments where there was laughter, and one was in one of the dream diaries where you were masturbating to like various um, yeah, media clips. Or uh, William, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, so, so it's like a touch by an angel clip, <laughs> right. which was you know super popular. Um, and then just like news clips from 1994 and the last drawing animation is a William Kentridge video, mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, I noticed a part where there seemed to be like an ultrasound and there were crosses yeah, yeah, in yeah. it. Yeah, that's in his work. Okay. I literally ripped that off of YouTube and it was someone taking a video of that video in a space somewhere, yeah. Okay. So I don't even I don't even know what that video is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that was the first moment and then I think there was another moment where you replayed this clip from like South African daytime TV mm -hmm. and it was to paraphrase like um, oh you're the perfect poster boy from what of what South Af Africa could be. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and that made me think a little bit about sort of the idea that I don't know, those are both kind of moments of tension or I would say maybe verging on cruelty in the daytime clip. And um, I think the, the ability to be humorless is a privileged position. Mm -hmm. That's something that like Lauren Berlant talks about. Um, and so, yeah, I think also we spoke a little bit about how your work can easily be read as ironic. Mm -hmm. Um, which is different than humor, but I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about. Mm. Yeah, life hurts, you know? <laughs> yeah, life hurts. Um, and I don't know, so humor isn't something that I've like explicitly used in, th in like my videos, mm -hmm. but it's come out, I guess, just out of like my own voice, you know, and the moments that I notice, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, the human thing is just because life hurts. <laughs> and, but we have to be able to deal with things and laughing about things. Mm -hmm. Helps, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're wrong, I disagree. Mm -hmm. The work is funny, like it's really funny. Um, there are parts of it that make me crack up, but I don't, when you're, other people aren't laughing, you don't laugh, right? It's kind of a social thing. Like, I know that in the Portland screening, there, there was more laughter, right? Um, and also the way that you contextualize things leads to humor. I think that people are more likely to laugh if they're aware that it's okay to laugh or something. Um, but maybe also in this case, it's not okay to laugh, which is kind of interesting to think about um, tying into this irony question. Like, it is easy to read it that way, but that's a false way of reading it. Like, that, yeah, that's a way of excluding a lot of the affect in the work, right? Uh, and a lot of the sincere kind of spiritual things going on in the work. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the humor is part of the access to me. Like, yeah, um, yeah cause it's there's almost a way of like, subverting the cruelty of the world through laughter, right? Or not even subverting, but just coming face to face with it and coming out alive from it, I guess, if you can, right? You just have to laugh when that happens. That's what I do. Yeah. But then also, I'm interested in like, humor is this response as a, as a response to tension, basically. 
And you were talking before about the spiritual dimensions of trauma. So maybe that's something you could tie in. Like, does humor and trauma have a relationship in this? Or is that, are they not related, right? But what kind of relationship, though? I don't know. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they can be a relationship. Um, You know, I can only go off of like my experience as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you have another question or audience question? I have one more question. Um, it's about Maxwell Chikumbuzo, um, who is, I guess, should we call him the CEO? CTO. The CTO of Safe, Safe Holdings. Um, and he's, this is a real company in the sense that in around 2015, um, he got a bunch of publicity for creating and debuting an electric car that never needs charging, um, thus defying the laws of physics. And it was interesting when I was reading articles about him, and they were pretty widely circulated. Um, he uses sort of a, just like a quotidian language to describe his car like he says it's like powered by five regular gel batteries and it's nothing sensational and i think it's interesting that you know whether or not his invention is real um he's i think he's kind of successful in that you know most of our interaction with stories like this is we read it and then we think of it as you know true or not true and then we kind of go on with it right um so yeah, can you just talk about him and I think the kind of speculation that he's involved in and maybe the trope of the unreli unreliable narrator? Yeah, uh, with Seth, uh what always fascinated me about the story was it just seemed like a useful uh, case study for a worldview that, as a group, do we had begun developing, um, that we wanted to reflect uh, specifically a, a Bantu um, philosophical uh, worldview. Um, so, Just something about that, though. Like, uh, my whole thing is like, if we can take, if we can accept that um, communication beyond life happens, then we have to accept that uh, our material condition isn't all that there is. Um, and so in, so in ideas that I'll call Bantu philosophy now, but it, what we're talking about is just uh, a set of regional uh, cosmologies, right? Yeah, which all point towards a pluridimensional nature of reality. Pluridimensional in the sense that there are different states that interact with each other and are not like independent of each other um, and need each other. So for us, I, and you know, this is like very basic and just uh, common, just like common knowledge in you know a lot of spaces, non-white spaces, but when you enter into like an academic environment or an institutional environment or any like serious thing, all of a sudden that reality has to be like, you know, dumbed down or uh, taken away. Uh, and I think I think we were really interested in finding ways of speaking to this worldview and seeing how 
that actually is applicable and has been applied today. Um, outside of the trend to uh, try and include alternative or you know indigenous practice in a conversation about da da da, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. So there's an there's an there's a there's like a need or uh, an impetus to like entrain the audience towards. And, and so faith really, faith, the faith story really represents, in an interesting way, this philosoph philosophical leaning that we've had. And, and for me personally, like just like as a practitioner, is like super inspiring. Because um, even with like the way a lot, some of his products have, are made, like the production of it is super future to me. Like, so the helicopter that he has, a lot of the criticism around that product is that, oh, he just bought the parts on Alibaba, you know, and put <laughs> it together, which is a thing you can do. And it's like, I mean, he did that, but obviously he augmented it, you know, yeah. this is the narrative. Um, and for me, it was like, what? That's, that's pretty smart, you know? Like, you can do that? It's like, yeah, it's true. It was like, that's how art production happens, like, in a lot of ways, <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was like a really interesting case study and yeah, just been super excited about yeah, the ways in which we can talk about uh, mysticism in the everyday. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a bit about the filming process for those works? So the whole film as well was also just about going to Harare and making sure that the stories were real or that it was like actual things, you know. Um, yeah, it was super interesting, you know. Um, just like we had like a two day shoot uh, the first day. Well, we shot everything on the, the second day, the interview and, you know, the, more, the, the video of people praying in the space that is like a, a morning ritual that they do every day and we just kind of bumped into that actually. And it was like, okay, we have to get this. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, they're evangelical types. Um, yeah. I mean, what else can I say? We almost missed our bus back, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm thinking about like, what does he think about the works? Like, has he seen them? Yeah, he's super enthusiastic, you know, he's like, yeah, he's just super enthusiastic. Um, I guess for him, it's like promo. Oh Actually, God. for him, it, it's more, it's like just, it wasn't even nothing, because we did, we, we initially did this video for a show in Paris, like a group show in Paris at the Museum of Modern Art. It was like, you know, a bit of a thing. And, but for him, it's just like, because he gets mad press coming in, or he, or at that time, he was getting like, you know, CNN and, Etc. coming in. So it was just like for him, I was just like a journalist. We were just journalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it wasn't even, didn't even get to that, you know, there conversation. There wasn't a conversation about art at all? No, no, not really. Yeah. 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 We actually built it as, <laughs> we actually approached him as wanting to do like a promo package for his company. Mm. Like, yeah. That's, uh, awesome. <laughs> Any questions in the audience? <laughs> Yeah, I'll come. I just saved it. Um, I guess the, I was going to talk more about Sayeth and kind of the different modes of spirituality as, because I saw that as sort of the mode of spirituality being used as industry. And like you're talking about, if you could talk a little bit more about spiritual industry. So I see that as like one mode and then the individual space kind of being another mode. Yeah. Um, what can I say about spiritual industries? It's, it's a thing. Um, honestly, <laughs> for me, the most interesting thing about it like, <laughs> is I feel like we're at a very, 
Atlantean like s stage. Like if you uh, follow some of the ideas and around antiquity or you know forbidden archaeology or antediluvian civilizations. Um, this recurring concept of like high civilizations that rise and fall. Um, and Atlantis, I know people get super turned off by this. <laughs> Honestly, for me, Atlantis is some shit I'm trying to reclaim because <laughs> that happened in Sahara Desert as far as yeah. I'm concerned. Like, but I don't know. <laughs> the more you know. But yeah, I mean, well, in 1600 BC, it was only black people, so whatever. But yeah. Um, Sorry. And so, so in so in like the, the mythology around like Atlantis is uh, this concept of them reaching a highly uh, technological and spiritual point and things just collapsing. And I think I, it feels to me like well, my my interest in that is because it's just coming from like oh, I wonder if like this is we're approaching this kind of moment, you know, as we see more and more. Um, these kinds of self-help, bruja, trends, you know, all of that. Um, the more, you know, this, I feel a little bit corny for doing this again, but I mean, there's this, it, this one episode of uh, Keeping Up With The Kardashians where they had a CBD-themed thing, right? So like this kind of like mass, explosion of or you know watered down expressions of you know mystic or occult you know concepts or cultures i feel like that might actually just like become more and more of the thing you know yeah. well i think that like oh, i was just going to say like yeah like spiritual spiritual in industries in the sense that you you know optimize yourself so you can then be more Productive. That's what I think you're thinking about. I think that, like, I think outside of the West, it's a lot more common to have I I informal spiritual marketplaces. Right, so Bahosi and I have talked about this in terms of like herbal nootropics, uh, Dominican tonic liqueurs, which are curative or medicinal. Uh, these are things that people sell from their homes, right? Um, and just, or give out to friends or something. So um, that's a kind of spiritual industry that's informal and uh, familial, I guess you could say, or intercommunity. But yeah, maybe you could speak to the larger kind of structural approach where it, it kind of bleeds more into capital. Is that a distinction that you have at all? I mean, I would say like it bleeds into capital, cap, capital. Maybe more like it actually uses the language of capital. No, um, obvious example being the whole uh, the the secret craze. Um, you know, a phenomenon that uses actually actual real metaphysical truths. <laughs> wait, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> if you say it metaphysical possibilities. Metaphysical possibilities. Yeah. You know, when we look talking about the law of attraction. Right? Um, a book like that that uses that concept, which is ancient, which, well, you know, but specifically with the secret because it's so tied into like this capitalist like drive and that the idea that you you would only um, want to access in a you know your inner divinity in order to manifest a bicycle, <laughs> you know, yeah, right, yeah, and that's it's super interesting, like, cause that's that's just really what it's all been, I find, like, no.
Mm, I think it's, it's also really about presenting what it, what it is. He's, you know, like I wouldn't attribute certain um, ideological leanings to, to Maxwell that he might not have. And from my experience of him, most likely doesn't have. Like, I'm sure he's not against, you know, taking military contracts for something, you know, whereas, you know, for me that would be not like super cool. Um, yeah, I would, I, and I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't look, don't really look to him as someone who's affecting things in that way or pushing progress in that way, yeah. It's more like a sincere example of something, right? Because for I think for him it's just he gets these visions and then writes it down, and mm -hmm. he's a, been able to make a company out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's probably not as much critical inquiry into it if you're profiting, like just kind of you're gonna keep writing it down, right? Yeah, and if you are coming from poverty, you are not thinking about a lot of things <laughs> or some things. Yeah, like your tendency will be towards accessing the market, you know, like if you come from a village. Of, uh, yeah, you have a very specific set of visions. Like it's not like, like my grandma talks about seeing figures in, in dresses of fire and stuff and it's like, you can't make money off of that, dude. That shit doesn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's a cool image, but there's no like, yeah. It doesn't tie into it as much, you know? Yeah, okay, I can. Tr I, I will try to describe this. <laughs> so it, it taps into a tradition of new age thinking around, that describes the creational experiences as an, as an act of creation. So the moment the universe began, a source energy has always wanted to expand in an expansive way, create, you know? So it's coming from this tradition of soul expansion. Um, and, but then specifically really ties into um, an idea around soul commerce. Um, sorry? Oh, shit, that was outside. Yeah, a concept called uh, soul commerce, um, which is an interesting way for me to describe reincarnation or incarnation processes. Um, so the, the contracts are like based off of this kind of like thinking. Um, and also it's attached to something that I found doing research and just general metaphysics, is there's always like a place that you go to where you come across this concept of um, a spiritual battle of like good and evil, warfare, um, but in the sense of like a kind of hijacking of, <laughs> a hijacking of uh, higher states, you know, um, of being in a hijacking of the reincarnation grid, of seeing this in, you know, Western New Age ideas, and I've seen it come up in like where I'm from. <laughs> um, and so an element of like the, the revocations are speaking to this idea that I've yeah I was kind of looking into a lot more. Um, but they also came out of like a period of psychic inst instability that I was like going through. Um, and so the texts themselves are like f sourced online. 
as I was trying to like find resources or ways of um, ways to protect myself. Um, and yeah, I don't know. does that help? Yeah, a lot of like my spiritual practice, like like what I was mentioning earlier, is like figuring out the med the mechanics of these things, um, and but also along with that, coming to a place where I'm not approaching certain practices with too much. word I'm looking for. But just like too much holiness or yeah, or too much preciousness, you yeah? know? Yeah, or reverence, yeah. Um, yeah, because that's not how it works. <laughs> um, yeah. That's, and we were speaking to this like in Eugene, but I think a lot of the times when we expect moments of the mystical to happen we tend to, or I have, or, you know, in the past tend to subconsciously expect like a soundtrack to start playing <laughs> or, you know, some kind of like visual distortion or like effects, you know, because we, the spectacular, we never, we don't really know how to see the spectacular in like our everyday mundane realities. Yeah. And I think with, with the, the you know, the revocation videos, that's part of like that that interest is like, well let me present some really heavy ideas, but as casually as possible. Um, yeah. And also in another way just Yeah. Yeah, all of it, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I guess my culture, like as a Sotutuana Sipedi uh, person, But that being said, I'm also really interested in, so there's, a, like, there's an element of uh, sacredness or, you know, just like sacredness that back home is attached to traditional African religious culture and, and thinking. Um, and I, I have like a bit of like a subversive interest in like, finding ways to dismantle that. Um, and so experimentation is like really also part of like what, like my spiritual practice. Um, 
trying things out. Um, but it always, it's rooted in my genealogy, as like we've spoken about before. Um, you know, yeah, my genealogy, I mean, anybody who knows what they're trying to do, you should know that that is your most ideal entryway into accessing, you know, um, is working with your genealogy, um, if you can, right? Um, yeah.